It is now my pleasure to yield the floor and welcome Dr. Michael White. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us. So I'm going to get started, and I'm going to try to make this as um, engaging as possible. Ben already mentioned Zoom fatigue, so I'm going to keep this as engaging as possible. We're going to talk about some kind of some ideas about activism, but then we're going to also leave time for discussion. Um, and I hope that as I as I talk, if anything comes up, make a note of it, throw it into the question and answer uh, little box there, and I actually can see it. So. I can even pull out and talk, you know, pull out questions. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ben, for organizing this. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Um, before I begin, though, I want to kind of say just a little bit about who I am and where I come from in order to contextualize what I'm about to say about activism, protest, and movements. Um, because I'm in many ways a, a very particular kind of activist. And I'm also have a very particular um, history. So I am a lifelong activist. I started doing activism when I was 13 years old. And truthfully, activism is all that I've ever done. Um, I started doing kind of, as I said, disobedient behaviors in school when I was 13. My first act of protest was to um, refuse to stand for the, the Pledge of Allegiance. And from a very early age though, I understood my actions. I self-identified as an activist and I understood my actions to be protests rather than simply acting out or trying to cause trouble. I consciously saw myself as doing activism. And this is, this is you know, I think one thing that's important to remember about activists, um, the history of activism is that there are times when activism is more popular than, than at other times. And when I started doing activism when I was 13, activism was not popular. It was not something that many people said that they were or that they did. Um, and so every year since the age of 13, I would do another campaign of something that I would research. So once I did an underground newspaper, um, or I uh, also sued my high school for drug testing athletes, I did an anti-war group. Um, and so every year I just did more and more activism. And my goal was to basically have this kind of like, um, <laughs> You know, it's kind of like silly to say it now, but like almost like a, a, a you know, an activist, a perfect activist pedigree or something. I was just like always obsessed with doing activism, thinking about activism. And so that kind of that fascination with protest um, led me to do all kinds of, of forms of contemporary protest. And it ultimately led me to co-create Occupy Wall Street, uh, which is a movement, a social movement that spread to 82 countries and a thousand cities in 2011. And at the time I was working for a a magazine called Adbusters. Now, Occupy is so, uh, feels so long ago that I don't really want to spend much time talking about it. Instead, what I want to do is I want to kind of bring everyone into uh, my world and how I think about activism right now um, in the years since Occupy. Because, you know, when we created Occupy Wall Street, I really believed that it was going to be this. Um, tremendously powerful movement that would forever change American society. And I think that definitely had an impact on American society, but it didn't achieve the level of change that I imagined it was going to have. And I imagined it was gonna have that change, level of change because it was in many ways like the perfect example of what activists had been trying to do for so many years, what I had been trying to create for so many years, which is a broad-based social movement that, that spread to many places that was largely nonviolent and had a, a kind of unified message. So when I when Occupy Wall Street dissipated and when it failed, I, I was driven to understand protests and activism in an even more uh, and an even deeper level than I had understand understood it up until that time. And that's really been the project that I've been working on for like the last nine years is really understanding activism um, from a from a deeper from a deeper level. Uh, and that deeper level is really seeing activism as one of the aspects of how social change is achieved in human societies. Um, so first though, I, a couple prefatory kind of remarks because I know that we're gonna stray into uncomfortable territory um, because one of the things, one of the conclusions that I've come to is that I believe you cannot fully understand protest without first separating protest from ideology. Um, and so this means that I'm not concerned with the ideological reasons why people are protesting. I'm instead focused on how protest creates social change. So to use the specific example, of Occupy Wall Street, if you go back and you look at some of the articles that were written about our movement at that time, you know, a lot of commentators would, especially if they were opposed to the movement, 
they would say, well, you know, oh, these people don't even know what they're protesting about. They, they don't know why they're protesting. And then they would try to prove it by interviewing someone who, you know, clearly had no idea what was going on. And, it, and the typical activist response to that was like, oh, that's like gotcha journalism, or that's just like, you know, um, you know, you're just doing, we didn't have the concept of fake news back then, but you know, this the similar, we didn't have those words, but the similar concept of, of that this is just, um, you know, lies. But actually I think there's something really important, which is that um, the reason why people join social movements and social protests has less to do with the ideology of the movement and more to do with what the movement, uh, how the movement makes them feel. And so I've been pursuing this kind of uh, line of th thinking, uh, which is to detach myself from contemporary activism and contemporary ways of, of protesting and instead try to see protests from a kind of a bird's eye view. But one of the consequences of detaching from the ideology of contemporary activism is that you end up seeing activism differently than contemporary activists. And this is actually a kind of um, painful process because you come to different conclusions than the movement. And I think especially for activists where the movement and one, one's peers and protest peers are so important, it can be kind of painful. But I, I've, I think that it's actually a good thing because one of the ironies is that activists must fight the status quo of activism just as vigorously as they fight the status quo of repression, which is to say that um, if you allow activism to ossify into a series of rituals that are performed without people actually believing that they're going to create social change, that is also a way in which um, protest is defeated. So in order to create effective forms of protest, I think that it's also important to break with the traditions, the traditions of activism and challenge um, contemporaries in terms of how we do activism. Okay, so that was kind of like my preferatory remarks, all of which is just to say that I might say some things that you strongly disagree with or, or feel um, are at odds with what you see the larger movement saying. And I acknowledge that I'm probably gonna do that. And let's bring it up in the, in the Q&A and let's talk about it. Um, if you find something that really makes you think strongly, then let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's go to those uncomfortable places in the questions and answer. So tonight I'd like to basically discuss five questions. And these are the like maybe five of the most important or the most basic questions for an activist. I'm gonna kind of talk about each one and then we'll go into the questions. So the questions are, what is activism? What is protest? How can activists use protest most effectively? How does change happen and who holds power? So these are the five questions that I want to kind of um, discuss with you. And what I'm gonna present is some of the ideas that um, I've been working on uh, most recently. So let's just start first with this question of like, what is activism? And so, you know, I just uh, finished co-teaching this class at Princeton of all places in the, in the, um, with the classics professors. And on our first day of class, we asked people, you know, how many people in this room like self-identify as an activist? And here we are at Princeton in a, in a classics department and like I, like half or more, like three, three quarters like of the class raised their hand and was like, it was a virtual class. So virtually raised their hand and were like, I, they self-identify as an activist. So that's, that's amazing um, because that is not always the case. And when I was in college or in high school, that wouldn't have been the case. So the first thing to understand about activism is that it's actually a relatively new identity. Um, the, the identity started to emerge in the, uh, you know, this, the word activist actually it emerges around the time of World War I. And originally it meant an advocate in favor of Germany in World War I. So it actually had kind of a right wing association. Um, and then the, the, the basic idea of activism is that uh, we, can, we can consciously create change through action. And that action can be individual action or it can be collective action, it can be organizing. It, it's just, it, but under all of that is this idea that, that everyday people can create change even if they don't um, occupy positions of power. So that basic idea is, is really recent, especially that part of it about the conscious creation of change and the idea that we can 
get together and create campaign strategies and all this kind of stuff. So it's really the kind the concept of the, the word activist is a, you know around 100 years old and the identity of the activist is also I would say really gained traction, you know, since the since the 60s and 70s. But that doesn't mean that activists didn't exist in the past. Obviously there was, you know, uh, you know, Jesus may have been an activist like it, depending on how you interpret the behaviors of people in the past, we can see examples of activism. And so one of the things that we do as contemporary activists is we draw these imaginary lineages in the, through the past, identifying where our um, activist uh, basically tendency comes from. And sometimes we exclude people who did use the word activists, like early people who were advocating in favor of Germany. And in other times we include people who never used the word activist. For example, I was just looking through um, a search. I did a cursory search. This is not, you know, if there's a, another person who knows more about this, then please correct me. But I did a cursory search through Gandhi's 98 volumes of collected works, and he never used the word activist. But for many people, Gandhi is a perfect example of an activist. So the point here is that it's a relatively new phenomenon that that um, the amount of people who self-identify as activists has increased over the years. The amount of people who uh, who have participated in protests has increased over the years, and that the archetypal activists, the the the, the activists who we believe kind of uh, um, best exemplifies activism at a particular historical moment, has also changed over the years. So that's the first question: What is activism? Well, activism is this is a is a person who believes that they can consciously create change through some sort of action and they develop a theory of change to you know identify what kind of action so the the second question is this question of what is protest and this is this is also a little bit of a um a tricky question because many of the behaviors that we would associate with protest today um obviously don't encompass all of the ways that people have ever protested before and at this, so, for example, like if you look at how people protested in the uh, early days of the American Revolution, so the they would most famously, I'm sure we all learned. I mean, I learned this in public school <laughs> when I was a kid about tarring and feathering. Um, they also had a, a tactic where they would like it was called like pulling down the house, where they would basically like go and take people's furniture and like take it into the street and burn it and stuff like that. So, the point here is that. We don't do those things anymore. <laughs> you know, no, no one's tarring and feathering people. Instead, we do marching in the streets or, or we do these other behaviors um, that, that they may, may not have done. So protest is, um, protest is, well, I like to define protest basically as it's any behavior believed by participants to create change. And the reason why I create such a broad definition is because there's many examples in history of forms of protest that don't make rational sense in terms of how they could create change, but that doesn't matter. They actually are interpreted by the society at that time as, as, as being protest and as having the potential for creating political change. I think one of the, just pause here, one of the best examples of this is um, the ghost circles, which were a a circle dance done by indigenous peoples in America. And they they took place like in the middle of nowhere. They had they had no, they were no nowhere near uh, a capital building or any source of power as we would today um, you know, identify it. But instead they were empowered by this 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 um, this idea that if this dance were performed, then sovereignty would revert from the settlers to and be returned to the indigenous people. And this, this performance of just dancing in a circle in the wilderness was treated as such a threat by the US government that they actually sent in uh, massive amounts of um, soldiers to stop the, stop the performance of these ghost circles, to destroy the movement. So the point here is that what gives a what gives a behavior the power to be identified as protest really comes from the people performing it themselves, and this is why you can see this again and again. You can see that that protests, especially in in very repressive uh, uh, regimes or under very repressive historical moments, 
they can sometimes take the form of behaviors that seem almost ridiculous or um, like it seems odd that that kind of behavior would have a political impact. For example, uh, right now in Thailand, what are they, what are the, some of the tactics that are being used? They have these huge, you know, yellow rubber ducks, <laughs> right? They have this, they do a three fingered salute. They have a certain gesture that they borrowed from Hunger Games and other things like that. And so the point here is that there's something about the, the protest behavior that is in itself not purely rational, not purely secular. Its power comes from a kind of shared shared belief. And so we've seen, um, and, th and this gives the wide range of how protests, um, what kind of behaviors can be protests. So that's one, one kind of way of looking at activism. That's another way of kind of um, seeing protests and I'm pushing for the broadest possible definition of both. Um, which already I think is really can make people uncomfortable because one of the things we like to do as activists is, is narrow, is to exclude people that we disagree from being activists because we don't wanna be in the same tradition as they are. So, but I wanna keep it broad. Now let's, let's go even deeper though. So if, if protest is any behavior that the participants believe can create change, what are some of the basic, um, theories of change, theories of how change happens. And, and, and I'm going to go through uh, what I identify as basically the four um, theories of change. I think most, if not all activism, I would argue fits under one of these four theories, okay? So how to visualize this that's kind of helpful, I think we're trying to understand this is to, is to imagine, a, uh, imagine that basically social change, revolution, um, is the is the interaction of humans and their environment. And if you kind of diagram this out and you put on, you know, you create a, a Y and an X, like a, you know, a cross, and on the, the four quadrants, on the bottom are theories of change that say that, um, you know, change and revolution is a process that involves the material world. And on the top are theories of change that say that it's a process that involves the immaterial world, the spiritual world or the non-physical world. On the left side are theories of change that say that, um, you know, change uh, involves humans. And on the right side are theories that say that change is a process that does not involve humans, that, you know, that something non-human creates change. So we're gonna go through each of these four, and this is gonna help us understand uh, both how activists think about change, but also some of the ways in which we can create the future of protest. So in the bottom left-hand corner of this, of this diagram that we kind of just imagined, we would put theories of change that say that change is the result of humans acting on their natural environment. And this is called voluntarism. This is basically the idea that, um, this is the most common form of uh, theory of change within activism. It's basically the idea that if you wanna create change in the world, we'll go out and do something, right? Direct action, right? You go out there and you like do a physical action and people will disagree with each other about what kind of action it should be, but they won't disagree. A voluntarist, so voluntarists will disagree about what kind of action it should be, but the voluntarists always agree that action can create change. Um, so some people might say, you know, oh, we need to create a march, like using contemporary examples. The most famous, uh, most common debate right now is like, some people say we need to create a march. Other people are like, no, let's go, you know, be Antifa, <laughs> you know, let's go like be more violent, more aggressive. We need to do other set of behaviors. Um, so that's the first one. The point here is that all four of these are going to be, are true, but it's a question of what degree to use each one. So the first one is voluntarism. It's the most common. Um, and, and it, it comes down to I, believing that humans can create change. If we go to the bottom right-hand corner and we, then we see theories of change that say that change is the result of non-human forces in the material environment. And this was this is a this is called structuralism, and it was very common. It's still common today, but it's extremely common with like um, Marxist historical materialism and communism that basically said that you know in order to have a period of uh, revolution or or dramatic social transformation, you need like economic forces, you need like large unemployment, or you need um, a kind of economic crisis, stock market crash, or something like that, which is a force outside of of humans in order to instigate the change. Um, 
this is a, I think, a very um, helpful way to think about activism because, and this is something you'll find in, in Marx and Engels and, and some of the early revolutionaries of the left, you know, they had the capacity to say that now is not the time to protest. They would actually say stuff like that. They would say, oh, based on my analysis of the structural situation in the country, now is not a revolutionary moment. And we should like, instead of protesting, we should do something else like organize or collect funds or work on books and stuff like that. They had a concept of basically that there was a time to protest and a time not to protest. I would say that contemporary activism doesn't have that capacity as much as earlier activists sometimes did. So moving forward now to the, um, the third kind of theory. The third theory is basically subjectivism. This is the idea that, this is the upper left-hand corner. This is the idea that social change is a process that involves humans, but not the material world. Um, and so what does this look like? This looks like basically um, that, you know, if you wanna change exterior reality, then you have to change your inner reality. And this would be people who advocate meditation, um, you know, there's like one of the most, um, yeah, basically like any sort of, um, you know, mindfulness practice, basically any, any concept that, that simply by changing how we see the world, we can change the world, it falls into the subjectivism. This is a slightly less common within contemporary activism, but it's still there, you know, especially among um, older, older readers will sometimes, uh, there's a book called A Course in Miracles where this is really strong as um, a book that's favored by older individuals usually. Um, the fourth option that is really interesting, especially as we are um, in this, I think this, this time, this particular time is theurgism. And theurgism is basically, would be theories of change that say that it's, that change is a process that um, comes from non-human, non-material forces. And what this really is, is basically at, at, at its most, I mean, there's a spectrum of all of these, obviously, but at its most kind of extreme point, theurgism is basically means divine intervention, right? <laughs> that that revolution and social change requires some sort of miraculous intervention in our world by um, divine forces. And depending on one's like religious orientation, you might be able to find examples of that um, in, in, in your, in your um, history. So there's also though, if that's kind of a religious theurgism and there's also the kind of scientific versions of theurgism. And I'm gonna go through a couple examples because I think it's really helpful to, to think about um, so I've, I, so what I, I started to collect these now because it's like, this is the one that people have the most stumbling blocks on. So I started to collect these kind of um, weird examples. So the first example is um, sunspots. So I don't know if we have any, you know, uh, astronomers <laughs> here tonight, but there is this phenomenon. I don't know if people know about this, but there's basically this phenomenon called sunspots and sunspots are just dark spots on the sun and their number and frequency varies throughout time. And they're visible, they're visible with the naked eye. So astronomers have been recording the number of sunspots since like 500 BC. I think there's records, there's like records of, there's very extensive records of sunspot activity going back very far. Um, and so there was a uh, Russian cosmologist in the, 19th, in the, in the early 1900s after the Russian Revolution, who basically studied sunspot activity and came up with this theory that revolutions tend to occur during periods of peak sunspot activity. Basically, when the sun is covered in many sunspots, revolutions are more likely to occur, was his, his theory. And for this, for this theory, he actually was kicked out of... Sorry. Sorry. I... Could you please repeat what you said? <laughs> How do I, sorry, I like have Siri talking to me right now. It's super annoying. Um, so, so basically um, he, he gets sent to a, a gulag by Stalin because he violates this idea of sunspot activity, basically violates the, the, the voluntarist and structuralist notions that underpinned communist um, theories of change. But what's so fascinating is, and if you're interested in this, you should dig it out because it's fascinating is that the number of revolutions that actually do occur during 
peak sunspot activity is very strange, very eerie. It's very, it's actually, it's unbelievable. And the most amazing thing about it from my perspective is that Occupy Wall Street also coincided with very high sunspot activity. And so we have an, so I have in my own personal life, an example of, you know, a social movement that I was a part of that one interpretation is a voluntarist interpretation of like, well, Occupy happened because so-and-so wrote this thing and that person went there and this person did that. That's a voluntarist interpretation. But a theorist interpretation is like, well, Occupy Wall Street happened because <laughs> the sun was erupting and it made people more susceptible to joining a social movement. What we're getting at here is this question of why is it that at sometimes people are more susceptible to join social protests and other times they're not? And could there be a non-human force behind that? whether it's God or sunspots. So I wanna give two more examples though um, that kind of go more and more in the scientific direction. So another example I think is really interesting is this, is this thing called Rai Aragat, which is a, um, it's a basically, I think, I believe it's a mold that grows on rye, which is a kind of, you know, grain. And up until, um, I think actually like, up until only like, relatively recent, like only a hundred years or so, I'm not sure exactly the timing, but basically the mold was so common that people didn't actually know that it was a mold. They just thought that it was a naturally occurring part of the rye plant. Now, it turns out that when you eat this, this mold, you get a kind of poisoning that can, that can cause hallucinations. And there's been some scholarship that says that, for example, the Salem witch trials may have been uh, like the mass hysteria that led to the Salem witch trials may have actually been triggered by rye aragots, this 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 bacteria, this mold that people were eating unconscious, you know, without realizing it in their food. So this would be an example of a kind of um, social change happening through a basically, you know, a pathogen in people's environment that they weren't aware of. And then the last example I want to give on this one is is another, you know. Um, scientific example, which is basically, there's a parasite called uh, Toxoplasma gondii, which lives in cat feces um, and, or it lives in cats and it's transmitted through cat feces. And it's believed, um, although the evidence is not conclusive, but it's believed that an infection with uh, the Toxoplasma parasite can have mind altering effects on humans. For example, some scientists believe that it can cause uh, aggression and impulsivity. So again, the point here is like, is to, as an activist, to expand our thinking to wonder about whether or not we can explain or understand why sometimes social movements seem to erupt and sometimes they don't, is there could be, could there be some sort of um, infection, some other, some other agent that's, that, that is out there that we don't know about, whether it's sunspots or whether it's, um, you know, these, the parasite or, or, or in our, in our contemporary moment, the coronavirus, which is creating tremendous amounts of social change unbelievable uh, amounts of social change and isn't really something that is under the control of humans or is created by humans. Um, so, and this is something that I think that is really struggling with the environmentalist movement because in many ways, coronavirus is, is giving the environmentalist movement at least some of the carbon reductions that it had hoped for. Okay, so let's uh, uh, moving forward a little bit. So that's the four theories of change. I'm gonna put uh, keep answering some of the, um, the two more questions and then we're gonna go into the group discussion. So the remaining questions are, I wanna just talk briefly about, well, this question of, well, how can activists use protests most effectively? Um, and the way, and this is a question that, you know, it's almost like one of those questions where you hear someone, it's like a paralyzing question <laughs> um, because I think that it's, it's, this is what everyone wants, right? Everyone wants to have some sort of formula for turning protest into change. We wish that we could have that formula and we wish that we could identify that, that formula. But unfortunately, protest is something that doesn't work that way. So it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question in a kind of sideways lateral way, which is to say that there are, there are basically three layers of change that activists can try to pursue. And the layer of change that you're trying to pursue will dictate the way in which you protest and how to be most effective. And so those three layers are influence, reform, and revolution. So just briefly, what I mean by that is influence is when we do influence-based um, activism, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to just 
change the behavior of the people in power. That's it. Like, we just want the person, you know, the mayor of my town, I want him or her to pass, uh, you know, rent forgiveness legislation or legislation against police brutality or something like that. Basically, you identify a person who has power with power and you put pressure on them through protests in order to create change. You're not interested in getting rid of them or anything like that. You just want to create influence operations. So that's the first layer. The second layer is reform. And reform means that you want to um, you want to change who has power, but you don't want to change how power functions. So this would be, for example, um, you know, elections, <laughs> you know, like let's vote for Biden or Obama um, because, or Trump, because we think that this person will create the change we want. We're not interested in trying to influence people in power. We're trying to change who the people are in power. And oftentimes on the left, this can come out as a kind of, we want to put people and on the right too, but we want to put people in power who are like us. You know, we want to reform the political situation by having it mirror us by electing people like us. The third, the third layer is revolution. Revolution means that you're trying to change the way power functions and not simply who has power. So I guess when, when we think about this question, well, how can we protest most effectively? First, identify which of those three layers are you trying to um, impact? Are you trying to do influence, reform, or revolution? And ultimately, though, and now we're going into the last question, and, and then I'm going to turn to, to discussion. Um, ultimately, though, I think that it, that the that the most important question of all for activists to kind of think about is this question of well, like who holds power, and the answer to this question really is um, the sovereign and this notion of sovereignty. I think sovereignty is an is like it's like the most important concept for activists to be thinking about right now. I've been thinking a lot about sovereignty. And if you go and you try to research the concept of sovereignty, you start going into a really interesting uh, alternate reality uh, where you, you, what you basically discover is that the sovereign always predates sovereignty, which means that there's always basically someone or some group of people take power. They break the law, they take power. And then a theory of sovereignty is created to justify why they should maintain their power. So in the example of America, you know, the American Revolution was illegal. <laughs> That's, it wasn't, it was, it was absolutely, it, was, it's a, it wasn't a, um, the, they had no right to, to break with the king. Instead, they had to, they had to argue that they had that right. They had to argue they had that right based on a concept of popular sovereignty and natural law. Then they had to successfully win the revolution and then once they had won the revolution, then they had to enshrine this uh, concept of democracy, a new concept of sovereignty to justify what they had just done. And so what I'm trying to say here basically is that all forms of protest in order to be effective have to target this concept of sovereignty because the sovereign is the one who has the power to decide and to make decisions that are binding on others. When we protest, what we're effectively saying is that we wanna be the ones who decide. We want to be the ones who make binding decisions on others. And the only way to do that is to become sovereign. And there's different ways of becoming sovereign. Um, there's also, and, 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 also off, and also there's different theories of sovereignty um, that you can base your campaigns on. So the three most common, you know, that we're most familiar with today are there's notions of popular sovereignty, which is uh, the idea that that the, the right of the rulers to govern us derives from our consent. And therefore um, we as people in a society always have the right to rebel um, because, because if the king, if the president is acting unjustly then they've lost their, their sovereign, you know, their legitimacy. So that's one theory, kind of popular sovereignty. Another one is the divine right of kings. You know, if you dig into the history of sovereignty, you actually find out that French kings, for example, were anointed with a special oil that they that they claimed came from heaven, uh, from an angel. And when the French Revolution happens, this this idea of uh, the oil coming from heaven was so powerful <laughs> for people that they the French revolutionaries actually sent someone to go and smash the the 
the oil vial so that, so that no one could ever use that oil again. Um, and so the, the, the divine right of kings, the idea that the person who, the king's right to govern, has, it doesn't derive from the consent of the governed, it instead derives from, from God in some way. And then the third is a kind of notion of some sort of religious sovereignty that, which is related to the other one, but basically that uh, I think ties to questions of holy lands and whether or not a, a religious um, a, a religious community has the right to have basically a a land where their religion is sovereign. This is something that comes up, I think, in a lot in Islam and also in Judaism and stuff like that. So that's that's a very um, that's the five questions I want to answer. And that's the very like high level theoretical um, discussion of the very aspects of, of protest and activism. And now in the discussion, I'm happy to go in any direction. We can even go, we can go uh, more concrete or we can go more abstract. I'm um, happy to, to go. So thank you so much for listening to some of those remarks. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we could all listen to you talk for a long time. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Jessica Cleese. I'm a sophomore at Tufts, and I am also part of Moral Voices. Um, so now we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, again, please submit any questions that you have in the chat using the Q&A function. Um, now we're going to start with some questions that have been um, submitted beforehand. Um, our first one is, um, how do you think that theories on protest and revolution apply and maybe how do they differ between communities over the world? Yeah, that's a good question because I think that there's a, you know, there's a question as to whether or not, like is activism a universal uh, thing or is this something that is mainly associated with with western democracies is is it something that can exist in other places these are all questions that i think are really important um so it's it's complicated i would say that basically you know protest protests can exist in any in any country in any culture in any society different governments relate to protests in different ways so one of the kind of traps i think of activists within western democracies is that Western democracies actually thrive on protest. Um, they need us to protest because protesting and showing our, our popular will in the streets is one of the ways that Western democracies um, legitimate themselves as governments that are responsive to the people that allow people to protest. And so in our countries, they actually want us to protest. I think Trump, you know, whatever, you, whatever people think about Trump, Trump was quite happy to have people protesting. Similarly was Obama, because, because uh, the ability to protest is, is in America considered one of the hallmarks of what makes our, our country good. You know, Whether or not they listen to the protests is a different thing. Whether or not those protests create change is a completely different thing. And so there's a pressure, I think, in Western countries to advocate forms of protesting that are known to be ineffective. This is a kind of cynical reading, but I think it's true. Basically, like, get people to protest but don't let them protest effectively. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> um, but in other countries, I think the situation is very different. I think that, for example, I have been, um, oh, this is a good question coming up about community organizing. Yeah, so this is this is, this is is really relevant. Thank you um, for your question. I'm seeing in the thing over here about would you distinguish between activism and community organizing is organizing an anathema to the occupy egalitarian model. So, okay, I'm gonna get to that in a second, but first let me just say, like, for example, like in China, I think China is a country that, is um, very reluctant to allow any protest whatsoever. So they, they are, they're against that form of mobilization and instead pride themselves on a very different form of social mobilization where it's like top down from the government. So long, long answer. I think protests exist in every country. I think that protests always exist in relation to the kind of repressive forces. And you have to be careful because even though it might seem well in China they don't allow protests, therefore if we allow protests in America we're more free. It can actually not work that way. It can actually be they're encouraging us to do ineffective forms of ineffective forms of protest in America. That's how they keep us unfree. Um, and then this question, of course, is that there's 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 different schools of thought about how activism should be done. And the biggest 
distinction in America, at least, is between activism and organizing, community organizing. And there's a lot that could be said on this. But I think that what I would just say is that uh, I see community organizing as a subset of activism and that community organizing is, is particularly of kind of a voluntarist idea. It's very deeply um, suffused with this idea that we can go into a community, even if it's our community or a different community, and we can like, we can create the change, right? Whereas activism, I think, is a kind of notion that is much more spontaneous. It's a much more idea that like we can put ideas out there and get people themselves to rise up in manifesting, in manifesting that idea, that we don't have to knock on doors to get anyone to do anything. Um, it's just two different two different models. And they kind of fight with each other, I think a little bit, so. All right, um, our next question is, um, your video on your site talks about the power of outsider activism, the ability to push against other activists and introduce your ideas of Occupy Wall Street without necessarily asking for permission. Do you think this can lead to problems if those speaking from the outside are not integral members of the community on the ground and may misunderstand the needs of those who will be most affected? Yeah, absolutely. Look, this is one of the things that happens is that um, this is a very good question, but we have to be we have to be realistic about it. Like, so I started doing activism when I was 13 years old and now I'm uh, I'm almost 38. I'm 38. And so in in those years, one's one's experience of being an activist changes. My I am not when I was 19, I spent a lot of time reading anarchist zines, uh, you know, I worked for magazine Adbusters, did all kinds of stuff. And as you get older, you, you, you become, you go into, you, you see different things and you experience other things. Um, and so I think that what I would say is that um, one of the kind of, um, one of the strengths of movements is that they have a culture. And one of the weaknesses of movements is that that culture can be very stifling because because there's a, a dangerous notion within, I think, a lot of activism, which which privileges youthful youthful approaches to activism over um, older people's approaches to activism. This is what I would say. So I think that, and this is this is another way in which in, ineffective activism is actually encouraged. So, for example, if you just look at this idea, like here's a really interesting idea: Why is it that we believe that young people? Let's look at the climate movement, for example. We see here a lot, like young people, young climate strikers have a more uh, likely chance of creating change around climate change than 60 year olds. This is kind of like a basic notion, right? I think this is like, I'm very, I'm very skeptical of this idea because I think that it, it, it obscures who actually holds power in our societies, which is, which is old people. <laughs> um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we have to Communities are communities are important and good, but they are also suffocating. And I think that they have to be careful not to fall into the trap of just succumbing to the flattery of youth. It's youth are, youth can be easy to flatter um, because you just. I mean, I, I'm just talking about my own experience of being a young activist. I was. I wanted to believe that as a 19 year old, I was the um, you know the pinnacle of the revolutionary subject. Uh, this is another question that you can like kind of look into is like, what do what do different activist movements, who do they identify as their agent of change? You know, for the communists, it was like the proletariat. For Mao, it was like the peasants. Um, and in, in a lot of contemporary American society, it's like the high school student. <laughs> and it's just something about that just doesn't quite work for me. But um... um, another question is just submitted. Um, you mentioned in your intro that activists often seek to create narratives and tie themselves to previous social movements. This took me a little by surprise to hear that such a conservative impulse exists within progressive activism. What do you think is the purpose of this legitimacy? Mm. Well, I think it, I think it's legitimacy is, is part of it, but I think that we are all parts of traditions, right? So like we gain, we gain strength from it. Um, so like if you identify, like if I were to like list my activist lineage, you know, I would say that it was, um, you know, it went through basically ad busters, which is culture jamming. And then you can trace back culture jamming into kind of like different cultures of like mix, mixing media and um, situationism and like Guy Debord and kind of stuff like that. So like, basically it's important 
so there's two reasons it's important. One is it, it's helpful because by identifying the tra tradition in which you are an activist, it helps you understand what your implicit theory of change is. So like, you know, my, the tradition I came from, a big part of it was this idea that we need to kind of basically give people collective epiphanies and that if we can just knock people out of their, you know, day-to-day -day live life, um, get them to live without dead time. That was a slogan we used to have, live without dead time or, Today, actually, people say like, you know, oh, they're, they're woke, you know, like we woke them up and all kinds of, all that kind of stuff um, is, part of the, is part of the lineage that I, that I was coming from, but other people have other lineages. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's, it is important because it allows you to see the tendency that you're within. Um, tendency is like another word that, that you see use a lot on the left. We don't use that much anymore, but um, so it's not necessarily a negative thing that activists like have recourse to a tradition, but I do think it's important to know what that tradition is because otherwise we kind of fly blind. We don't understand why we're doing certain behaviors and not others. Um, next, is protest more effective depending on who the activists view as their audience? Protests could be aimed to influence those with power or to activate those in the populace who agree with the protesters or to change the minds in the um, in the populace who are opposed or to reach those who are, who are tuned out? Mm. Um, I think that it's not, so I think that, no, I think, I think that, that that kind of, uh, that thinking might lead you astray because, um, so one of the kind of paradoxes of protests is that, I alluded to this earlier, but basically I don't believe that people join a social movement because of its uh, explicit and rational, ex it, it's explicitly articulated ideas. Um, and so this leads people astray because they think, well, I want to create a social movement or a protest that, you know, um, lowers the voting age. Let's just make up an example, lowers the voting age in America. Therefore, I need to identify the audience and I need to know about the audience and I need to pitch at them and I need to make, I need to pitch an idea that's going to work for them. There's all this like messaging this idea of like creating the right message, focus grouping, all kinds of, I think it's completely misguided. I think instead what happens is that um, people pitch an idea from the edges, right? Something that makes no sense. And then all of a sudden everyone's galvanized by it and they like uh, are driven towards it. Um, even though the idea really can make no sense. That's why you have things like QAnon or, you know, like, we have the same thing on the left. We have we have irrational belief systems. So, I think that what you what is instead important is that you have to create an idea that um, basically social movements are are created by a kind of an affect, uh, a mood, a contagious mood, a new tactic, and then some sort of like basically you have to do something that gives people the belief that change will happen. That's the crucial part. So it, it's not so much pitching pitching to an audience as um, creating something that people can momentarily believe in its capacity to create change. And people will, will believe in things that are not rational in their, in their capacity to create change. And they'll, and they'll switch sides. I guess the point I'm trying to get to is actually before the, before the Trump election, just most recent election, I got contacted by the FBI and also like these journalists from like NBC and stuff. And they wanted to know about foreign influence in American protests and stuff. And one of them actually told me I didn't talk to the FBI, but I did talk to the journalists privately. I didn't talk on the record, but one of them told me, oh, we've identified someone. And I looked at my email and she had emailed me. And so this is a person who was part of Occupy Wall Street and then is now part of, or was part of QAnon, right? And a lot of people apparently made this move from Occupy Wall Street to QAnon, two movements that you would not think are associated. The point here is it's not really about what the ideas are. It's about how those movements make people feel. Our next question, um, how, should, uh, how should the activists view those sitting outside the movement that they are advocating for? Well, I think that they should view them like a sovereign would, which is that uh, you, it's, those people are fine. You know, most, people who don't join a social protest are often correct in not joining a social pro protest. Think about the number of protests that it, have existed in the last you know, 10 years. And then think about the, the number of those that were, were truly uh, necessary 
for everyone to join. It's very few because activists are constantly calling for protests, protests that they themselves know will not create change. Uh, many protests that are organized, especially large scale protests, are not actually created with the intention of creating social change. They have other intentions, building email lists, getting donations, gathering publicity. So there's this common narrative. Sometimes it's, it's easy to blame like, oh, why aren't those people joining the social protests? And instead it's like, well, what are the activists doing to make those people believe that they should join the social protests? And often the answer is nothing. <laughs> often the answer is, I, we're just doing our thing. We're, we're young and we wanna, you know, it's just like, this is how we do it. Um, and so, so the one answer is we don't worry. Those people will join the movement when the movement is worthy of joining. And the other answer is most of those people will just side with whoever, whoever wins. And this is actually a, a, an insight that I think is really important, which is that if you think about activism as a way of capturing sovereignty, then what you're trying to do is you're trying to gain power and make decisions about people who actually disagree with your movement. And so you have to, it's a different kind of game. You're not trying to win them to your side. You're trying to get yourself into a position where you can make decisions that they will, that they'll accept. And most people will accept decisions, for example, based on who won the election. That's a huge one in America. If you won the election, most Americans will just agree that I'll do what you say, you know, you're the government. Um, so, and so I think that what I'm saying is that activism that thinks more strongly about sovereignty can orient less around like complaining that those people didn't join the movement and more around thinking, well, how do we get ourselves into a position where it doesn't matter if they join the movement or not? All right, um, we have time for one more question. Um, from your theories on protest, what do you think about the contrast in messaging from those looking to abolish or defund the police, which is clearly a revolutionary revisioning of what our country should be, versus those calling for police reform that would maintain the structures in place? And do you think these perspectives are incompatible? Um, I don't know exactly how to answer that question. I mean, I think that. Um, I, again, I think I would just answer by referring back to this, this thing about the layers of change, you know, like, I think that there's a, there's always a kind of, there's forces who will see a movement towards revolution as an opportunity to push for reform, because that's, that's another thing we didn't get into too deeply, but basically these times of social unrest and social protests when people are, are passionate around an issue are one of the times in human society where we do make sudden changes. So for example, on the police reform issue, you're gonna see people who are, who just, who see social protests merely as an opportunity to push a more reform um, or influence-based agenda because they rightly so believe that this is one of the few opportunities they might have to get that kind of lesser goal through. They think that's important. They have a different theory of change. They're not interested in, in revolution. And I think that can be very frustrating for people who are um, demanding uh, more, you know, fundamental changes in the way that power is structured. I think that, you know, I personally, you know, as I get older, I am less and less interested in influence and reform based kinds of activism and more and more interested in um, revolutionary kinds of activism, but that has to be kinds of, but, but also not interested in revolutionary kinds of activism that just try to replicate, you know, 20th century notions of like storming the, the palace and all that kind of stuff that's just not gonna happen anymore. Um, and so I, I guess what I, what I, again, would go back to is this idea that even though mass movements and social movements involve lots of people, they don't need to have the majority um, and they don't need to be like the biggest. So again, what I would say is if you're pursuing a more revolutionary angle, you can kind of just ignore, I mean, you have to be careful about them trying to co-opt in, into reform, but at the same time, I don't think that they, if, if the formula, if the formula of your movement is correct, no, nothing can stand in its way. We've, we've seen that from the history of revolution. Nothing can stand in the way of a well-executed revolutionary movement. It's just that that level, that capacity is very much lacking today. So much so that I would say that there is no uh, force that I know of in America that is capable of a revolution at this time. All right, Dr. White, thank you so much for your fascinating perspectives on activism. My name is Alex Smith. I'm a member of the Marin World Voices Initiative, and I'm a senior in the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts University. Thank you to everyone who has attended our lecture this evening or is watching the recording after the fact. We hope that you'll leave tonight 
with a broadened perspective on what activism is and what it can look like and what it can be. Thank you also to Pete Loeb and Lauren Bloom for helping make this webinar possible, as well as Seth Marin for his continued support of this initiative. If you are all interested in getting involved with Moral Voices, more information can be found on the Tufts Hill website. We hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you again, Dr. White. Thank you, everyone. Bye.